All right, thanks for watching. And today I would like to talk about an important identity that relates the infimum of a set with the suprema. And let me motivate this a little bit. So from our previous video, we know that the supremum of a set always exists or is infinity, but the question is how do we know that the infimum always exists? And it comes from this formula here. But let me just remind you of the concept of infimum. So suppose S is a non-empty subset of R that is bounded below by M. So this is S and this is little m, then we say that m is the greatest lower bound and we write m is the infimum of s if and only if the following thing holds. If, if I give you a number that's bigger than m uh, for all, m1 bigger than m, this is m1, you can actually find an element of S called S1 that is smaller than M1. There is S1 and S, such stuff. S1 is less than M1. So if I tell you you're not the worst student in the class, it means there's a student who's worse than you. All right, now, as I said, you know, um, we want to show this time that infimum uh, exists, and it turns out there's this absolutely beautiful identity, which I'll explain in a second, that actually relates the infimum with the supremum. And for this, let me define what minus s is. Here's a definition. In other words, for minus s, you just take any element in s and do minus that. So in other words, if s is any subset of r, then minus s is just the set of uh, minus x or minus s where x is an s. In other words, all that this is, you take S and you reflect it across the origin. So for instance, let's take the set 1, 3, which is maybe here, 1, 3, and then it contains those two things, and again, that is S, and the question is, what do you get if you reflect S across the origin? Yes, the set minus three minus one. So if S is one comma three, then minus S, it's minus three comma minus one because essentially what you do for every x in s, you just do minus that, minus x, and that ultimately gives you uh, minus s. And now the question is, let's try to figure out how the infimum of s is maybe related to minus s, because notice, And again, that's very beautiful to discover if you want. So note, first of all, the infimum of S, it's one. So this is the infimum. But then the question is, where does one appear in minus S? So where does one appear in minus three comma minus one? Well, one is minus minus one. Then one, it's minus minus one. Where, but how is minus one related to minus s? It's precisely the supremum. So it's minus the supremum of minus s. And indeed, notice, what do we have? The infimum, which is one, it's also minus the supremum of minus s. 
And lo and behold, we can finally state our result. So beautiful fact, and that you should memorize if you're in my class. In other words, the infimum of S, it's minus the supremum of minus S. In other words, the infimum and the supremum are related except you put minus here. Or if you'd like, another way to uh, you know, use it is whenever you put out this minus, you get plus, but then supremum uh, becomes infimum. So, okay. and in fact, let me, um, again, why is that useful? Because you would like it because it says you don't have to do any work anymore. Because essentially anything that's true for supremum is basically also true for infimum. So if I ask you to show any stuff that's true for infimum, you just have to use this formula and whatever fact we prove for supremum. And again, if you want just another nice uh, illustration of this. So suppose we have the set S. Okay. Then this is the infimum of S. On the other hand, we have minus s, and that's the supremum of minus s. And all that this is saying is those two are opposites. So if this is 3, that should be minus 3, for instance. All right, and now let's show this property that infimum of s is minus supremum of minus s. And by the way, it's an excellent exercise to test if you understand what a supremum and an infimum is. So here's a proof. So let's call this gibberish M. So let M be minus supremum of minus S. And what we need to show is that the infimum of S equals M. So show that the infimum of S is just M. Then we're done. Okay, then what do we need to show? Remember what the definition of infimum is? Well, first of all, we need to show S is bounded below by M, but this one I will skip. It's somewhere in the notes, but still important. Um, but, and also we need to show the following super important thing, namely, if I give you a number that's bigger than m, so if m1 is bigger than m, then you can find some element in S called S1 that is smaller than m1. In other words, again, if you're not the worst student, it means there's someone who's worse than you. So show. So in other words, show if m1, it's bigger than m, then there is s1 in s such that I get s1, it's worse than you. s1, it's smaller than m1. So that's very important. Once we've found that element and we've shown that it's smaller than m1, then we are done, okay? So, so in particular, again, let m1 be greater than m. But notice, uh, here we have a bunch of minuses. So in particular, if m m1 is greater than m, then minus m1, is less than minus m. But what is minus m? Well, if you put minus here, it becomes the supremum of minus s. But notice what we have. We have a number that's smaller than the supremum. And remember, if something is smaller than the supremum, then something new happens. This is like saying you are not the best student in the class. So if you draw S minus S here, here we have M minus M, which is the supremum, 
and I just told you there's a number that's smaller than the supremum. So bang, by definition, we know there's a number, there's an element that's bigger than it. So by definition of the supremum, the supremum of minus s, we know there is s prime in minus s such that s prime, again, there's a student who's better than you, it's greater than a minus uh, m1. Now, but what does it mean to be in minus s? It means you're the opposite of an element in s. So, but by definition of minus s, we know that s prime is minus some element, let's call it s1, with s1 is in s. In other words, S1 is minus S prime. And I'm claiming that this S1 works, so that's what does the job. Well, first of all, S1 is an element in S. And all that we need to show is that this S1 is less than M1. Because remember, our picture was as follows. We had, again, that was our least, uh, our inf, that was M1. And we had to show that there's some element that's smaller than M1. But what do we know? It just follows from this. We know S prime is greater than minus M1. But S prime is greater than minus M1. So by definition, um, minus S1, it's greater than minus M1. And so S1 is less than M1. Huh, isn't that what we wanted to show? Precisely. So indeed, S1 is a number that's smaller than M1, and therefore we are done. So therefore we have shown that, again, uh, M is the infimum of S, but remember M was just um, the minus, the supremum of minus S. It's the infimum of S. Very good. So it's this interesting interplay between um, you know, the infimum and the supremum. So first we use the fact that we wanted to show something is an infimum, and at some point we use the fact that something is a supremum. And again, why is this useful? Because essentially it says you never have to show statements with inf because you always just use this formula. And in fact, let me give you a great application of this. Because we've shown the least upper bound property, how about the greatest lower bound property? How do we know that inf exists? So greatest lower bound. Namely, again, suppose S is a non-empty subset that's bounded below. So uh, if S is bounded below, then the infimum of S exists. Then S has the greatest lower bound. That is, infimum of S exists. In 
other words, again, if you have some set S and you know it's bounded below by little m, then you know that the infimum of S exists. In other words, the infimum of S always exists if you include the case that it's minus infinity. And let me prove this. Okay. And again, it's just a very quick application of the formula. So, I can prove, again, suppose S is a non-empty subset of R that's bounded below, S is bounded below by M. By M, that's again not minus infinity, then First of all, let's show, we want to use minus s, so let's show that minus s is bounded above, then, so for all s in s, s is greater than or equal to m, which means minus s is less than or equal to minus m, but the point is minus s is just a generic element of the set minus s. So what this shows you is that minus s is bounded above by minus m. So minus s is bounded above. Again, by uh, minus m. But because minus s is bounded above, we know the supremum of minus s exists. Then what is the infimum of s? It's just minus the supremum of minus s. But then the infimum of s, which is minus the supremum of minus s, again, we know this exists, and minus a real number also exists, so the whole thing exists as well. Quick and easy, we never show directly that the infimum exists. We just use the fact that the supremum exists and use this little formula here. It's very neat. All right, and next time we'll do even more applications of the least upper bound property to show why it's useful. All right, thank you.